Hello, viewers. Welcome to NRB TV's live talk show, Bangla Mail Journal. Tonight, we'll be discussing some Canadian issues as well as the pandemic COVID-19, which is known as coronavirus. Let me begin with introducing our guest, starting with someone who is very well known to our Bangladeshi community, the chairperson of Canada Bangladesh Friendship Group, honorable member of Parliament for Beaches East York, also who is a member of the Parliamentary Standing Committee for Industry, Science and Technology, Mr. Nathaniel Askine Smith. Nathaniel, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we also have here a renowned businessman, Canadian entrepreneur, the managing partner of Globalive Capital and CFO of Globalive Technology, former co-founder and CFO of Wind Mobile, as well as CEO of Globalive Communications, Mr. Bryce Sestuk, CPA and CA. Bryce, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining. Uh, we also have a renowned journalist, uh, very well known to Bengali community, uh, Muhammad Ali Bukhari. Mr. Bukhari, Thank you welcome. for having me. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, let's start with um, uh, some um, the situation we all know, 49,816 49, confirmed cases, 2,852 deaths in Canada. Nathaniel, let me begin with you. Can you please tell us um, an overall situation? Where do we stand? Is everything under control? Uh, you know, the viewers from all over the world uh, uh, were watching here. So we just wanted to have some sense that how we are doing and where we are. So first I would say all levels of government are working cooperatively towards not only a solution to the health crisis, but also trying to respond as best as we can to the economic crisis, which has resulted from the health crisis. And so at the federal level, we have seen significant supports for small businesses. We've seen significant supports to ensure that there are wage subsidies for companies and then through companies to employees so that we don't see massive layoffs. We of course have seen significant layoffs regardless. And so we also have an emergency response benefit for people who have been laid off to ensure that there are there's an income support there for people who, who would otherwise have fallen through the cracks, uh, ineligible for employment insurance. And in terms of the health, crisis and the response there. We've seen important steps most recently, but really a collaborative relationship with provinces that have the the primary jurisdiction for health. And so we have seen recently an announcement for hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, vaccine R&D, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for testing and uh, serology testing uh, development as well. And so I, I think critically, we need all levels of government to continue to work together, largely the economic response pieces are in place more more I think uh, to come to some extent but the the primary focus has to continue to be uh, our health response because we need to work with provinces to set out plans to reopen our economy and that can only happen where we have the health situation under control and so we do see the last thing I'll say is we do see the curve being flattened in some provinces are of course doing better than others, but we do see the curve being flattened overall. And so we are at the point now, I think, where health experts have to be talking to people in industry to say, how can we safely start to open up the economy in phases? And that will be led by provinces because provinces are in different places, but it will be a collaboration with all levels of government. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for, uh, for the overview. Uh, We'll be going through some uh, some issues. Uh, uh, if I go to Bryce, uh, what, what what is your uh, perspective here, uh, Bryce? If you could just give us some sense that uh, from your perspective. Sure. Thank you again. Um, so I would agree with Nathaniel in general. We are definitely on my side of the fence, giving our three levels of government a passing grade. This is an extraordinarily difficult situation. There's definitely no perfect playbook here. We have some analogs we can draw in certain areas from past, uh, past either a, you know, a health crisis or maybe an economic crisis, but this is a different animal. We are a Western democracy, as you know. By our nature, we're more measured than certain other systems, and we respect multilater multilateral cooperation in institutions. Our levels of government are communicating very effectively from my perspective, working well together. They're focused on health first, which they have to be, 
and everything else is below that, but also being prioritized effectively. I would say in general, we're flattening more effectively at a comparable stage than most Western democracies, maybe other than Australia by my math, and worse than some of the best performers, but generally showing up very strongly here for the nature of our country's systems. That said, um, and I think most will agree that we do need to look in the mirror at this. We do have to determine where there are weaknesses and we are not immune to weaknesses. We have to course correct continuously. And in future, we're gonna go through some of this and we're gonna be all, we're gonna emerge from this better and stronger. And we're gonna you know, be more ready, we'll say for lack of a better way to say it, for, for things like this happening again in the future. Uh, if I go back to Nathaniel, before I go to him, uh, Mr. Bukhari, do you have any uh, anything to say in this uh, point, at this point? Well, uh, what Mr. Bryce mentioned, uh, the reference of Australia, I think New Zealand in the Western democracy, they are doing very well. And uh, in the Atlantic uh, newspaper, uh, the Prime Minister of, of Australia, uh, uh, her her uh, role is uh, very well, and uh, and when we compare uh, the situation with the United States, uh, according to Globe and Mail's article uh, from Lawrence Martin, he mentioned that uh, Canada is doing very well. But the thing is this: that uh, there are some deaths uh, in the senior uh, long-term care homes and. Um, other situations which was not taken properly, uh, that is the great concern. I think Mr. Nathaniel can address uh, his position from the government. So uh, with respect to long-term care homes, that obviously is the the great weak or has been the great weakness and where we have seen great tragedy. Here in the East End, I, I can point to St. Clair and O'Connor, but I know there are other places across Scarborough and across our city and across our province that have faced the same tragedy. Of course, the management of long-term care is fundamentally a provincial issue. And so we have previously helped to invest and prioritize home care by way of our bilateral health accords. But the the day-to-day -day management, the overall policy making for long-term care rests at the provincial level. So what we have been able to do at the federal level is where we get to a crisis point, we have responded where upon request, and we've seen requests from Quebec, and we've seen requests from Ontario, we've responded with uh, Canadian force medics and, and healthcare professionals to assist where the where the situations become incredibly dire. And otherwise, I, I think the the, the focus has been to ensure that we're working and supporting provinces, knowing that the lead continues to be with long-term care at the provincial level. I would say the, if, if, if I could point to, I, I think where we could be uh, much more focused and, and, and roll out even more support, it would be, I think, being a stronger leader, while healthcare continues to be a provincial jurisdiction fundamentally, I think we do need to continue to lead the conversation on testing and tracing. And I, I do think if we're going to get out of this crisis, it is going to be because be, be because we have a, a sufficient health response and we don't yet, I, I, in my view, have the scale of testing required. We don't have the technology for rapid testing yet required. We don't have the serology testing required and we don't have the digital contact tracing in place that will be required. And so. I'm glad to see that the sort of freeze the economy in place and best support the economy as we can. These measures have rolled out in significant fashion. And there has been significant health efforts that have been put into place for vaccine R&D. And some of the conversation has begun in earnest on, on testing and tracing, but that is where certainly as a member of the industry committee, I will be, I will be focusing my efforts. So uh, Nathaniel, can I ask you uh, that, uh, so far, I know that more than 30,000 uh, uh, testing are going on at this point. Uh, you mentioned about rapid testing. Uh, have you heard about a rapid testing kit uh, from Bangladesh? Uh, if, if, if Bangladesh wanted to export something like that, would you be able to uh, show interest uh, for having that kit? 
So I have not heard of the specific rapid testing kit out of Bangladesh. I, I, I am familiar and I and we've obviously seen, if we're pointing to success, we've seen South Korea that has been incredibly successful. And weeks ago, we could read about the fact that they had drive through testing centers where people could receive a text message within 10, 15 minutes uh, with an answer to uh, whether they're positive or negative. And so I, I think whether it's Bangladesh, whether it's South Korea, frankly, there's a company here in Toronto, Spartan, uh, that has received some government funding to get the rapid testing rolled out in a, a fairly quick way. I mean, I, my own personal view is I don't care where it comes from. We need to get the technology going and we need to scale up the our capacity to do these tests incredibly quickly. And there will continue to be a place for both of these kinds of tests, right? So rapid testing will continue to be critical, especially early on for our healthcare professionals in long-term care homes. Uh, in other settings where you can do so many more tests all at once, even though it, it, there's a delay to it, uh, that will still, I think, have a significant value and role to play, perhaps for school teachers and, and, and other institutional settings where we don't necessarily need the, the rapid response, but we need to have have scale. But in, in both cases, we, we need the virus testing, and, and we should be clear about there are two different kinds of tests, uh, viral and serology. But on the viral testing, we, we absolutely need to scale up capacity and we, we need the rapid testing technology. And so I don't care where it comes from. And if there's a Bangladesh company that is able to provide that scale for us, then then sure, so long as we aren't gonna face supply chain issues down the road, uh, given all countries face similar, similar crises. I, I was going through a news that um, uh, PPE and masks uh, were, uh, uh, brought to Canada from China, and uh, some of them were defective. Uh, uh, can you tell us about that? That what happened? Why we uh, for, we did some order without um, checking, or uh, was there anything lacking um, from your point of view? I, honestly, I, I don't know the uh, the details of that procurement of that of those particular. I know there's there are a lot of different. Um, there have been a lot of different procurement contracts put into place with different companies and different providers. And so I don't know the specifics of what went wrong there and whether it was a lack of due diligence or whether it was a company that had a track record that simply failed to deliver in the particular instance. But I do know, having followed up a little bit, I do know that there will be there was a commitment to replace it completely and that the government will be made whole and that Canadian society will be made whole with, with that PPE. Uh, PPE remains a challenge largely on an allocation basis to make sure that it's not just our, our core frontline healthcare workers that are receiving the PPE, but it is other frontline social service agencies that also have the necessary PPE. And in other cases, grocery store frontline workers have the PPE necessary. So uh, there are still challenges on PPE and, and those have to be addressed. And the federal government is still, again, our federation presents enormous challenges in some ways in responding to this particular crisis, which is why PHAC, Public Health Agency of Canada, was in many ways created in the first place to try to address some of these uh, federal challenges in the course of the pandemic. But it, it it does continue to be a challenge where the federal government continues to take a leadership on the procurement to, to some extent. $2 billion has been allocated for and and under it's being used at the moment to procure PPE, for example. But it, it is a challenge where there there have been delays at times where provinces have first have to glean the information from their hospitals and frontline healthcare workers. That comes into the provincial hands, then that has to come to the federal hands to 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 procure. So uh, it, there are. I, I don't want to suggest that there haven't been some challenges, but on that particular case, I, my understanding is that it ultimately was resolved in the end. Thank you very much. Uh, if I go to Price, would you like to add something about this uh, equipment? So like uh, masks, uh, uh, PPE, uh, and other th things we just discussed? And you're asking me, sorry? Yeah, do you want yeah. to add something? Yeah, you know what, I would like to, and I'm gonna go in a couple of different directions. The first thing I'll say is I'll take a step back and I'm, I wanna cast a macro lens, kind of a look in the mirror lens for a moment. And I'll go I'll go two, two ways as it relates to these supply issues. First off, I think, and this is not Canada, I think almost globally, we have struggled as humans and in politics with long-term planning of certain types of issues known or expected. And I Agreed. think, I Agreed. think the, yeah, I mean, 
you know, we've seen, we've all seen the Bill Gates TEDx video. Now we're also aware of kind of the, the, the knowledge of one of these things happening. And candidly, we're just not that good as a, as long-term thinkers in the political side and even in the business side at planning for this stuff. Let's, let's just be honest. So, I mean, someone asked me, what would you do differently in that regard? I said, look, if I was prime minister, I would probably think about a new ministry. I'm going to go to an extreme here of, uh, we'll call it long-term planning. Okay. And maybe the first place I would focus on are what are some of the profound risks that we face as a country and as a globe. And I've got four that are interesting to me right now. Pandemics would be one. Uh, nuclear, which is not talked about as much, but is a risk. AI and the future of AI and climate change. Those are my four. And I would try to integrate that in a ministry that would have long-term planning thinking and be able to go across uh, min across all ministries to have a coordinated uh, effort. Coupled with that, so when you then start talking about that, you then say, okay, let's keep looking in the mirror for a moment and let's talk for a minute about supply chain. Okay, Canada, we are a very globalized trading country. We are a significant export import nation. We've had, what, what we've seen is that the nature of globalization is positive and negative. When countries uh, that, you know, produce certain things at a higher ratio or that we don't produce, you have a health crisis and export restrictions start to come in, that's a problem. Or when your domestic manufacturing has not focused on some of these areas, that's obviously a problem in cases like this. So again, casting a casting you know an eye into a mirror, I think we would all agree that there's going to be an exercise coming out of this that is gonna look at long-term planning and it's gonna look at supply chain. And then if I go more tactical and I say, okay, so let's talk about masks and PPE and let's talk about you know, ventilators and all this kind of thing. It's kind of a common theme is that there was a mad scramble um, where pretty much any industry that could get close to production on these types of things. And, you know, there's a there's a contract for ventilators with a uh, aircraft simulation company in Canada. Anyone who can sew garments is pretty much putting together some kind of hospital clothing or masks. And the list goes on and on and on. So what I would say is, and, and in the scramble of that to Nathaniel's defense on something like a procurement of some masks that are defective, you're gonna have problems. And it just is what it is. But on a material basis where we as a society have had to be quite reactive because of some of our other longer term issues, I think we've done everything in our power, both at in the industry level and at the government level to, to try to push this as quickly as possible. Uh we some of some some people say that uh, uh, we could have been in better shape if we would have uh, uh, closed the border earlier than we did. Um, so, uh, like recently, American President uh, Mr. Trump has expressed his desire to reopen the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, as as U.S. has more than fifty-five thousand. Uh, deaths, would it be realistic to reopen uh, the border sooner, Nathaniel? So first, in answer to whether we would have been better off closing the border earlier, I think, you know, hindsight is, it's easy in hindsight to say, we could have done this, we could have done that. The challenge is, people were pointing their finger at China as an example to say, well, let's close the border to certain hotspots. When you actually look at the numbers now, <laughs> the problem has been the transmission from the United States, principally when you look at Ontario numbers. And it's not easy to look back and say, at the time, we should have closed the border to the United States so much faster. And even if we had done it a little bit faster, would it have stopped it in its tracks? No. So I, I, I struggle a little bit with the hindsight analysis, but there's a place for it. I don't think that place is particularly now, but there, there will be a place in the coming months as on the outside of this pandemic for that hindsight analysis and to point to what went wrong and what could have been done better and to Bryce's point to say, how do we do better long-term planning? Well, we learn from mistakes and and, and we learn from that hindsight. Um, in terms of reopening the border, I can't imagine there would be any appetite sitting here today to reopen the Canada-US border until public health experts that we are relying upon are convinced that the situation is under control in in the United States. And I don't think we can say that today. Uh, what would you say, uh, Bryce, about this? 
So uh, I'm in violent agreement what, with what Nathaniel said. Um, the reality is, is to have shut the border down effectively would have required a global shutdown. And in fact, when you start looking at the analysis that's already coming out from the, the, the border shutdown, it was not China that really was the problem. And I think Nathaniel said that, but there were a bunch of other countries that were already having cases moving around that came back into our country. We're so global as a country here, as you know, that it, it was a full shut or leakage. So let's, let's take that point. Um, I think based on a little bit of research I did ahead of this, the experts seem, and I'm not a scientist, but the experts are saying, and this echoes it, Canada should not reopen its borders until new cases of the novel virus are on the decline and each one can be traced and contained both at home and in the country in question. So you, you need it contained on both sides of the border of who you're admitting. And that is going to be a while and that is complicated. So I will always err on the side of the health risk and being safer from a health perspective. And I think that, you know, that kind of echoes what Nathaniel was saying. Uh, do you have anything to say, Mr. Bukhari? Uh, well, uh, combining uh, Mr. Bryce and Mr. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, both of their statement, what I see that uh, Mr. Nathaniel at, uh, at the beginning, he has outlined that uh, all level of government and all level of uh, business to all other sectors are working collaboratively and cooperatively, they are working. Uh, but uh, when he's uh, saying that uh, uh, we have still problem with uh, testing and tracing, that is uh, a big issue. And when we uh, consider the statement from uh, the chief medical health officer, Teresa Tam, uh, what she said on April 15th, uh, that nearly half of all coronavirus related deaths in Canada happen in long term care homes and the number is only expected to increase. So now uh, the thing is that we have seen in the uh, in the beginning me, until uh, mid of March uh, that there was no seriousness uh, from the Canadian Border Services Agency uh, to ask people, those who are entering, Mr. Nathaniel said all the transmission occurred, uh, what I believe, uh, what he meant, uh, transmission from the United States. So if that happened, why uh, not a serious measure has been taken from the uh, Canadian Border Services Agency? All right. Uh, we have one uh, similar type of question. Uh, like people are complaining, uh, at least I have one of my friend, he was coming recently uh, from the airport. Uh, he was saying that uh, there are not much um, checking uh, uh, at the airport. Uh, they were uh, like uh, not much social distancing were maintained at the airport as well. Uh, and uh, uh, do you have any anything in your mind, Nathaniel, that uh, uh, I know it is a little bit late now. I'm talking about uh, at least uh, three weeks earlier, uh, things happened. Um, like, what was the lackings and why it was not uh, that much tightened in the airport? Honestly, so I mentioned earlier the need for a review in the coming months. And I mean, in real time, I, I think it's fair to say that CBSA's, CBSA should have been stronger at the, at the airport when people were coming in to make sure that the there was greater clarity about what self-isolation meant and that people were confirming that they would self-isolate. That was in, that the response was not as fast. I, I, I think as we look in hindsight, we'll see that the response should have been faster, but the, we are talking uh, in a relatively short period of time, CBSA corrected it and then people, when they were coming into the country, needed to, as they were at the kiosk, confirm that they understood uh, about the self-isolation measure. So uh, honestly, I, I think we've landed some things very well, other things we've landed and then had to adjust, sometimes very quickly. In that case, I think I, I think when there is a review, it will, I think it will be fairly pointed out that the border, CBSA in particular, should have been clearer about those instructions. Um, it, one, one last point I would make is, when we talk about the self-isolation and people coming home, I mean, even with those admissions, 
uh, I was just speaking to a health expert earlier today who was talking about family members who didn't understand what self, self isolation meant. And there has been a bit of a challenge, different health authorities with slightly different uh, advice as far as it goes. But uh, overall, I think one of the challenges we face is we are in, in a democracy and we have different values that, and certainly we value our freedom and we question the heavy government surveillance. And so other countries have been more successful when they have used digital, fairly extreme, I would say digital surveillance when it comes to those quarantine measures. Uh, we haven't done that. And that is, that is a question of different values that come into play. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, let's move on to the another point. Uh, if I just want to come back to the previous point that uh, PP and Musk's a thing, uh, you know that uh, who official said uh, World Health Organization uh, mentioned yesterday that uh, it's far from over. So um, people uh, need those kind of things, even general people, people like me and you. Um, but it's, it's, it's very, it's costly. Uh, so do you have any plan or government have any plan to bring more, uh, little bit uh, less price, less surprises and um, supply to the general public? I don't know, honestly. So I think the focus right now is ensuring that there is sufficient PPE for not only frontline healthcare workers, as I mentioned, but also for other individuals that are going to be in, in regular contact with the public because of their frontline work, whether it is uh, the frontline in a long-term care home, whether it is the frontline at a methadone clinic, whether it is at a frontline in a grocery store. I, I think that has to be the focus principally. In terms of us as, as regular citizens, there having spoken to the CEO of Michael Guerin as an example, she wants the whole East End uh, masked basically, but largely it's because when folks are going into other major public settings like a grocery store, and her answer to that has been, let's make sure that there are volunteers putting together these cloth masks that individuals can wear themselves. Um, I ideally, yeah, I mean, ideally we would get to a place where we would have such a supply of masks and they would be at such a low cost that people wouldn't necessarily need to rely upon sort of handmade sewn ones. But I, I personally think right now the focus has to be on ensuring that we don't have those supply chain issues that Bryce was talking about, but also that we're focused on, and this is not a federal question really, it's a provincial question really about the allocation of them, but we're ensuring that they get into the hands first and foremost of those who are interacting with so many people on a regular basis in the course of a day. Uh, do you like to add something, uh, Bryce, here? Yeah, you know what, I, if you're okay, I'd like to add, uh, I'd, I'd actually like to go back to the airport uh, comment one more time. And I think that the best practices that I've been able to see, and I'm gonna focus on the South Koreas, the Taiwans, uh, the Singapores of the world, the one of the common threads which nathaniel mentioned very early in this conversation was around testing okay and what i from what i can tell they were very early and they basically almost have these things at the ready when they trigger an issue like this where they start doing thermal tests that measure for fever exactly okay? and that's that's a temperature check of some sort or a thermal scan okay it i would fall off my chair if a year from now every airport and the officials that administer it have, don't have some kind of a thermal capacity, okay? So let me make that comment. The reality was though, is that when we were looking at the airport situation, we didn't have all the tools that we needed and we never have. And so we reverted to questions and people were scared to answer questions certain ways, not understanding the full ramifications and it just becomes a very muddled process. So um, the point here is back to best practices, back to setting frameworks and back to taking the best of, of other, what, what the best in the world and not to be scared to look at what others have done. Uh, with respect to the mask uh, issue, uh, Nathaniel, I think hit it dead on. We, um, we focus on the people that need it most in a constrained supply situation. As supply catches up, we can expand it outward. I think the costs of these things are, re are relatively reasonable and I would expect as, as supply increases, they will come down even further and uh, they will be quite accessible over time to the general pop. And to follow up 
on on that briefly yeah, sure. I, mean, I think bryce is exactly right to focus in on testing we can talk about different kinds of testing so that uh temperature testing is critical in all sorts of settings and, and we're starting to see it in when we've seen in other jurisdictions and, and we're starting to see more of that use when it comes to grocery stores people entering into again where there are larger public settings and that is and i think airports are another obvious example as we start to reopen uh, some some of our economy in that way uh, i i think so testing in that way testing when it comes to viral testing testing when it comes to serology testing we just need to if the who has been talking about testing and tracing testing and tracing we have not yet i don't think caught up to just how important that message is and i look at for example the modeling coming out of the public health agency of canada and dr Teresa tam's work and Again, their their estimates or their their optimistic estimates are based not only on strong physical distancing, which we've undertaken. They're also based on strong testing and tracing. And I can't sitting here today say that our country has the strong testing and tracing that the South Koreas of the world do. All right, thank you. Can I ask you, even though uh, it's it may be a provincial level question, but uh, I'm going to ask you if you just we all are uh, resident of um, Toronto. Somehow we have to, we sometimes we have to go to the doctors here and the hospitals. So um, I was hearing the news today as well. Uh, a lot of, uh, I don't want to mention the percentage, but uh, other patients other than COVID-19 patients, they like can't go to hospital. Uh, they have a lot of other issues. Um, how do you like to address those kind of people? And um, the reason I said I don't want to mention the percentage, because some percentage of people have died because of not going through the surgery and other things they uh, needed to. Uh, do you have anything um, to say about this? That how can you address that? So this is a provincial concern. And I saw Minister Elliott say something along the lines of 35 or so people. Yes, had, that's right. Had, but she said may have died. Uh, because of lack of access to healthcare services, so it wasn't yet. It, it wasn't to me clear cut on what the what the specific uh, how we how we can necessarily carve up the stats and say this was this was necessarily the cause. H having said that, this this is the this isn't the only challenge, right? So we see we have an opioid crisis right now. People aren't able to get the services that they need. We the shutdown has serious costs and economic costs turn into social costs, which turn into health costs. I mean, the, the, the shutdown itself is going to have knock on effects, which we might not be able to easily point to. This is a death caused by the shutdown, but, but the, there are problems obviously, and, and trade-offs that are made in, in these, in these policies that are chosen. The, there are ways to address that. While it is a provincial issue, I would say having the conversations I've had with our local public health officials, they are working, to ensure that where their hospitals are, uh, where they where if they were to see a significant uptick in COVID patients, they would make sure that there are there's a separate sort of process intake process. So there's no interaction as between people who might have COVID and others who are coming in for surgeries. And of course, and I, I would think this is obvious, and I, and I would hope that this is in place at the provincial level in all cases, where surgeries are necessary. I mean, I, I, my understanding is that they are going ahead. So I would certainly, if I were at the provincial level, want to understand if that is the baseline, why did these individuals pass away for lack of surgery, that surely we want necessary surgeries to continue. Uh Thank you for that. Uh, Bryce, do you want to add something? Um, I'll go in two directions. The first is, is that from a business community standpoint, when you talk about the notion of this pandemic crowding out other things, okay, Nathaniel identified a number. What I've been seeing, um, and uh, you know, it's a small example in the, in the bigger health scheme, but to, to take an example is organizations large and small had to adjust in days to effectively shutting down our entire country. And what did that do? That sent people home working virtually with a whole new social construct of not being able to get out and also to have their kids also locked down with them and try to manage that over the course of, you know, what's turning into multiple months. And what that has then compounded to alongside the work pressure of the extra hours and so on with, with respect to kind of keeping your business running and all of that is an exacerbation of a very significant mental health 
uh, set of issues. And I'll tell you, a good friend of mine who is a senior executive at Scotia, Scotia Bank is one of the top five banks in Canada. The banking system has been under extreme pressure, as we know, to push out liquidity, to get loans out to the business community, to basically work arm in arm with the government to implement policy. He told me that they spent a week figuring out how to work remotely, and then they were working 20 to 21 hour days to push out that liquidity and to get the system moving and lubricating the economy. And they had to take a pause at a senior leadership level and roll out a mental health program in conjunction with a service in Toronto to 80,000 employees. That's one example. I have never, I'm a big uh, active player in the startup and innovation economy in Canada. Every conversation I'm having right now has a mental health component to it. And that's only the business level. The other thing I would say is that I, I like many in Canada, get inundated with US news and the New York governor, Andrew Cuomo has been uh, very good about uh, the, providing a human touch and articulating kind of the New York response and, and, and really the human element to the crisis. And sadly, they do have to model in their, in their kind of broader macro frameworks, the knock on impacts of the crowd out of the health system. And it is a clear issue. And I think Nathaniel's right. When the, you, know, you do everything within your power to prioritize and to do all the things you need to on essential surgeries that are outside of COVID, but there is a crowding and one has to model it and one has to you know, jump on that human element as quickly and effectively as possible. Thank you, Bryce. Um, well, uh, I have something to ask uh, both uh, Nathaniel and Mr. Bryce uh, that uh, uh, since uh, Mr. Nathaniel has concern with regard to those um, deaths uh, due to not having the access uh, in the hospitals, uh, uh, even though this is a provincial matter and uh, the minister uh, of the province of Ontario, Mr. Ms. Uh, Elliot, she said that we have saved uh, thousands of lives. Uh, how uh, 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 this matter is uh, uh, considered by uh, Mr. Nathaniel and both Mr. Uh, Bryce, i like to hear from well, I think uh, Bryce was uh, referencing that to some degree when he talked about ensuring that you are modeling the the impacts, right? So you're saying to prevent deaths in the COVID context, here are the steps we need to take. What what are the knock-on impacts economically? If there are economic impacts, what are the mental health impacts? Bryce didn't go here, but there may well be an uptick when we see downturns in the economy, then there are increase mental health impacts and then increase suicides as, as just one as just one follow on example from the mental health impacts. So as you are modeling the the total cost benefit of an action that and the policy that you want to implement, of course, it's it's important to say this is going to save lives in the COVID context. Similarly, you have to say, what are the costs at the same time if we put this policy in place writ large and economic, mental health, uh, other potential lives uh, because of a, a crowding out of resources in the healthcare context. And so I think overall, it's fair to say today that the uh, we have importantly flattened the curve, but I think we do need to look at the conversation today to say, and, and constantly, right? We, we constantly, and the Minister of Health in the province of Ontario ought to be doing this in light of this information to say, can we make any additional policy changes to ensure that we continue to protect people from COVID, but that we are addressing and making sure that people continue to get the essential services and surgeries that they need if we haven't managed that balance perfectly uh, yet. Uh, all uh, right. Yep. yep. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, I, I agree with what Nathaniel said, and I think he covered it well. So, But I would like to add one other point that was uh, brought up earlier, but I'd like to kind of reinforce the significance of it. And that is uh, senior and long-term care. Okay. And it's, it's an extraordinary thing that's happened here. So I think you, you started the conversation with the stats of Canada, and I think it's around 28 or 29, kind of rounding up to 3000 deaths in the country of which 2000 plus are in senior homes. Okay. Now that is, a, that is an astounding number, uh, like from a relative percentage basis and makes one almost fall off their chair and kind of weep with, with sorrow at, at how that has, has manifested. What I will say is that we need, again, I come back to, to learning. I've done some work over the years on extrapolating 
the demographic changes that are happening in Canadian society long term. And it is like most other countries where it is getting older, our birth rates are low, you know, we're sustained by immigration from a youth perspective and so on. And we have what has been called in many ways a tsunami ahead of capacity issues around our aging population and the respect that they need and deserve and the long-term care that they require as they age that we have not adequately addressed as a society. This, every death is tragic. This is but a small manifestation of and showing us some of the issues as we as we stretch at the seams and crack at the seams of a, of a long-term care system with a demographic tsunami coming at it. So I wanted to just reemphasize that point and I will continue personally to be working on this alongside a lot of others and uh, there's a lot more work to be done ahead. So let's move on to another point. Uh, people are talking about um, economic recovery plan. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, that who official said yesterday that this pandemic is far from over. So what is our plan to reopen our economy? Uh, but at the same time, I want to mention that uh, Quebec uh, has more casualties than any other provinces. And their premier announced today some particular dates to reopen some schools and business, etc., um, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Mm, what is like, it could be a, a provincial level question, but I'm just uh, asking as well that um, what would be our uh, economic recovery plan? So there are a couple of different ways to think about economic recovery plans. And at the federal level, I know we get asked the question quite a lot about when is the economy going to reopen, but just as it was provincial action that largely shut down the economy, it is going to be provincial decisions that reopen the economy. And for good reason in many re respects, because different provinces are in different places. BC is in a different place from Ontario, in a different place from Quebec. And BC, actually, when you look at the scale of their testing, to population, they are in a place where they can plausibly say, we're, we're, we're talking about reopening our economy in a way that frankly, I don't think Quebec is in, in, in the same way yet, but uh, all province, we see Saskatchewan rolled out their first, that was the first province to talk about a five phase plan to reopen their economy. And it's important that these provinces, I think are starting to lay out these plans because then there can be accountability, criticism, reflection and improvement. And that will only be good for all of us. And important too, I think that we see Saskatchewan and some of the other provinces that are less affected that are rolling out these plans. So then other provinces that have been more deeply affected can look to and, and, and learn from. I, I do hope, and, and I've been in, engaged a little bit with the mayor's office in Toronto, I, I do know that they are looking also to engage with experts in different sectors to say, how can we help you reopen while also maintaining the best public health advice? So you won't reopen as you were before, but how can you reopen with proper physical distancing and, and the best uh, safety measures in place? So I don't, I don't have a good answer for you from the federal level on when do we reopen? I do though have a, a better answer. The federal government has backstopped most, I was talking to someone today from finance who said, for every dollar spent in, in the economic backstop to date, 90 cents has come from the federal government. And so we're gonna continue to see given fiscal capacity, which is not never ending at the federal level, but certainly is greater at the federal level than municipal and provincial governments at the moment. And so we are going to see the federal government play a significant role in public investment on the way out of this and whether that is infrastructure for capital infrastructure for our cities, whether it is supporting health budgets on reforming long-term care, whether it is investing in a clean economy transition, there, there is going to be a significant conversation and it started already at the federal level about what that kind of stimulus on, on the backside looks like. Uh, Bryce, you want to add something here? Yeah, the only thing I'll add to the more tactical reopening question is the other thing that we can look to is there are other countries and states in the case of the US that are ahead of us and are, are have taken different approaches, some much looser than ours. And so I think we've got a lot of things to look at and actually have, I won't say the luxury, but we'll have people that have blazed a trail ahead of us that we will be able to learn from. And I know that everyone is looking very closely at the Swedens of the world, Belarus to a degree, Texas, and you know those kinds of places. So that'd be my point there. On the economic side, this is a very interesting situation. So it is, as we've said multiple times, it is completely unprecedented from an economic standpoint. We will see 
the largest hit to our GDP in this country and generally most countries in the world of my lifetime and probably I think my parents' lifetime if I do the math and maybe even my grandparents' lifetime. Um, we are going to add, and this is just factual, a record amount of federal and provincial debt to our balance sheet in 2020, okay? We are gonna be edging back into the periods where rating agencies are gonna be looking at us, where fiscal uh, smarts really come to the forefront. At the same time, we've seen the ramifications and any economist will tell you, you don't stop stimulating the day you all are back in mainstream society. No, we are troughing in a business cycle that's gonna require significant stimulus and some very significant visions of the future of our country. And I would be so aggressive as to say, I don't like to predict too much, but I would predict that as an example in Canada, I think the next election could very well be fought predominantly on the issues of the vision for the country and how big a role government plays in it, how big a role business plays in it, and some of the thoughts around you know, social and socialization initi initiatives versus sectoral focuses on the business community, and the list goes on and on. So I agree 100% with Nathaniel. Things are starting to be talked about on the back end, and I think there's a, there's a long road ahead that allows, done smartly, and, and I, I have my own uh, notions of, of how I would like to see it, um, and, and many in the business community and many in, you know, in the country that, uh, that will, will cause us to kind of change many things that we currently do. And one thing, one follow on comment on that, because, and just to reemphasize it in this context, we don't successfully get back to any sense of normalcy without massive capacity in testing and tracing. Yes. And so, and, and just as one simple understanding of this, if there is, and there will be another flare up of the coronavirus, the way we deal with it is to test trace and there, therefore contain so that it is not, it doesn't cause this problem all over again. And we've un undertaken the lockdown that we've undertaken for, for, for not. And so it's really, really important that we have those measures in place to successfully reopen our economy and our society. I would say to you, if there was a headline for this hour that we're spending here, the testing and tracing headline as a re-emphasizing point that both Nathaniel and I are making in, all, in many ways here in, in different kind of contexts is, is the takeaway point in many ways. Okay, uh, Mr. Bukhari, do you like yes, to ask uh, uh, well, uh, Surely testing and tracing is a very highlighting thing, but uh, uh, as Mr. Nathaniel mentioned about the stimulus package uh, trajectory uh, from the federal government, uh, I like to know, uh, and also uh, people from our community and others have concern that uh, where from the federal government is providing this funding and how they will uh, realize this uh, funding uh, later on. Uh, because uh, when you are considering to reopen the economy, you have to consider those things. And at the same time, you have to consider this part testing and tracing because uh, uh, the second wave of uh, virus uh, impact uh, is, uh, is uh, is uh, eminent, uh, so how you will consider those things, Mr. Nathaniel? Uh, so I I would just reemphasize the need to, one, partly it's more dollars in the system, partly it's a better coordinating function from the federal government in collaboration with provinces on testing and tracing. I was speaking with incredibly smart public health folks today who are saying on the tracing side, or on the uh, serology testing side, let's use BC as a, as a lab here and a pilot. And if what works there, let's, there are a number of different potential technologies that Health Canada is considering. BC's CDC is already very focused on looking to uh, test some of these uh, serology uh, tests. And so if BC is able to get one that works, then let's use that and roll it out across the country. And so the federal government's gotta be very much seized with, you know, uh, Bryce mentioned looking at, at uh, states from a reopening the economy point of view, and, and I think that's ex exactly right. We can similarly look to some of our provinces that are doing important work on on the testing side to scale that up. And, and on the stimulus side, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. I, this is a conversation that has begun, but we are not we are not close to the end of the conversation. So 
the the idea of what the stimulus at the back end of this looks like uh, is still being debated and we are we're what what is today april 28th uh we are days away from may 1st and may 1st is a pressure point for many small businesses in our community and we don't frankly have i think the provincial action necessary to avoid really disastrous effects on with respect to commercial evictions and so there there is a program collaborative program between federal and province to try to mitigate that to some extent it's it's going to be a challenge though and so the federal government some of the ministries are in a place to have this conversation in a serious way finance which is the principal place to have this conversation overall has is not in a place to to, to fully realize those conversations when they're still focused on the day-to-day -day, making sure that the economy isn't falling apart what what would be our priorities if we do reopen uh what would be our priorities and at the same time i want to ask another question uh, uh, i was just watching the tv and a, a scrolling was there uh, is is there any chance for declaring recession uh, soon or anything like that? Sorry, declaring uh, recession. I, I, I economic uh, economic. Right, uh, Rice may have a, uh, <laughs> a smart review, but I think <laughs> yes. I think I mean uh, we are we're not looking at growth. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't, we uh, we are factually in a recession. Yeah, the exactly. way the way the economists measure it takes a little bit of time to be calculated and and declared, but no one is under any false illusion that we are not in a recession. Exactly. The only question is, is how actually bad is it going to be? And 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 how long does it last? So how how long is it going to be? Is the recession if this if this does last longer than we hope it will? And then even when we come out of it, it's going to take a while for their consumer confidence. And frankly, if you have, it depends how long this goes with federal spending too. That if we're having to again backstop the wage subsidy, which is a $73 billion program for another tranche, it, it becomes increasingly hard for the federal government. Again, there's not an, an unending amount of money at the federal level, even though we do have more fiscal capacity than the other levels of government. And so it, it, it sort of depends uh, how we don't yet know, I would say, although I, I'm more optimistic today than I was maybe a, a month ago about how long this lasts. I we don't yet know just how deep the economic consequences will be. Uh, Mr. Uh, with regard to this uh, economic consequences, we have heard from the IMF that uh, the, there is a, a economic shrinking position would be 6%. Yeah. And, and in Canada, it would be like 6%, but it can <laughs> recover until next year's second quarter, it can recover 4%. And we have seen uh, the Great uh, Depression period uh, Canada uh, did very well comparing to United States. Its uh, em employment rate was lower than the United States. So I think Canada can traditionally do well uh, comparing to other countries. I don't know. Uh, that is the projection I have read uh, in the newspapers from the RBC, uh, Scotia and CIBC, all the economic experts. They are projecting this kind of recovery can take place in Canada. Uh, I don't know what. Yeah, is I, I, I think again the the goal here is free freeze the economy in place. We then have a health solution, and then we are able to come out of this in some semblance of normalcy. It, it, it is. I mean, it, there is going to be a, a challenge. So long as people are physically distancing, some some businesses are going to have a really hard time coming back right away. So even we see schools reopen say in the fall in Ontario and some provinces I know are talking about an early opening, earlier opening, but we, big gatherings are still going to be a challenge. Our hospitality sector is not going to come back quickly. Um, we haven't seen yet real problematic consequences in our real estate sector, which is a huge part of Canadian economic growth in the last number of years. So uh, I, I I defer to those much smarter economists, but I, I do see there's no certainty here is, is what I would highlight, I suppose. And so I think we are in a, a fairly, um, so long as we continue on the pace that we are on and so long as we get that testing, tracing those health solutions in place, I, I am fairly optimistic. Now on the question of priorities, I, I think there are some obvious ones when it comes to 
Um, I would even like to see building underway, more building underway on capital infrastructure in Toronto with congestion rates so low. Um, I mean, I, I think we can be doing some of the, the infrastructure now, but infrastructure will be a big piece of any stimulus on the way out of this. I, I think I highlighted the clean economy and, and long-term care provincially. We can't we can't accept anything like this again for our seniors and our, and our, our healthcare system. And so there are some elements that I think are fairly straightforward and obvious, but um, I'd be interested to know, Bryce, what you see as sort of the key, the key sectors or the key priorities when it comes to the, the, the stimulus on the way out of this. Great question. So, and look, that is going to be the debated question with everyone having a different perspective. What I'll say macro is where I lean. Is, so first of all, the ability to have financial capacity to create the shock absorption necessary to allow us to buffer that loss of economic GDP for a period of time is critical. And we have a, we have a lot of it, but to your point, you run quarter after quarter with this kind of stimulus on the more basic wage and related and it can get concerning quickly. But let's let's assume that we get past that and we can have a little bit of optimism there. Where I land on this equation is when you are very deliberately spending to stimulate, I do like to look at it as an investment mindset. Okay, and by that I mean, what is long-term return? And by long-term return, I mean investing in the people side that creates that long-term return or in the, we'll call it the, the broad term of infrastructure that creates that return. And to, to just to throw a few examples, so education, there's a ton we've been talking about doing there, particularly as it relates to innovation, okay? I think there's a huge opportunity there. And I think that with maybe, you know, some interesting things happening with how student years are going to fall and uh, some people out of the workforce and skills and so on, very interesting area. Clean tech as a, as a skill retrain from a certain other industries would be one example. Then we look at things like infrastructure, okay, broadband. You mentioned clean tech. I have a vision personally around uh, looking long term at some of the Alberta challenges and some of the transition opportunities for uh, you know long term done smartly uh, to to some clean tech and, and clean tech innovation. Life sciences. We're very good at information communication software. We're not so good at life sciences from an innovation standpoint. I did a presentation in Ottawa a month ago on taking the flywheel of the Canadian innovation ecosystem and applying it to life sciences. I see huge opportunities there. You mentioned Toronto, transit. Uh, we need to spend more on transit to keep the city moving and to attract the business stuff that we need to do. Housing supply, okay? Huge issue for us in our bigger centers, opportunity. Uh, domestic supply chain. We just sat there and talked about how we've yeah. got to onshore a bunch of stuff that it hasn't been onshore. Advanced manufacturing around that you know, so on. And so look, I think there's going to be a bunch of stuff that has to happen to get us through this. There's going to be a bunch of stuff to inventory health stuff and get our supply chain working effectively for the future. And then there's going to be a bunch of longer term investment thinking that we can do. And I think all allow us to be to come out of this kind of stronger once we're through the pain. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, Mr. Bukhari, do you like to add anything or I want to go to another point? No, you can proceed for me. Okay, so uh, I, I I actually wanted to discuss uh, the, about the gun control here, but before I go there, uh, one of our uh, viewers actually made a comment here on Facebook asking when it will end. Do you have any answer for that? I mean, with reference to our previous conversation, we're starting to see provinces lay out different phase plans, but I would, there is, thankfully a conversation about reopening now, but I think we absolutely have to bear down and we can't, we can't stop what we've been doing. What we've been doing has led to success. We've seen flattening of the curve. And if, if I know there's a lot of angst about, we gotta, we've gotta reopen, we've gotta reopen. And, and I know that pe people wanna get there as quickly as possible, but everything I have heard from people from public health has been yes, and that is an important, we, we of course have to reopen as quickly as we can, but for now, people have to understand that we have to bear down and we have to continue doing what we're doing. And so uh, we're gonna see more from this from provinces and then everything I think personally, and this is a conversation our, our Minister of Innovation is gonna be at committee on Thursday and my questions are gonna be focused on this. Uh, everything I think depends in some ways on testing and tracing. 
so that we can reopen more quickly with confidence. Uh, if I can add, yeah, if I can add one thing, you know, the one word we haven't used today, uh, maybe uh, just because of the nature of the questions is, is the word vaccine. I'm going to come to that right. in a second. But before I do that, I just want to talk about the word end is interesting to me because end is, does end mean going back to exactly how we are right, like, you know, the day before all of this started? Right. I don't, you know, you think about end, end is a series of stages, okay? And until we get to a point where we can actually inoculate, I think, you can't, say there's a perfectly clean end to this. What we do hope obviously is that economic activity and human activity is, is increasing rapidly, uh, even in, even until inoculation. So that would be, um, I think that would be the point. The other thing I would say is, again, I keep coming back to countries are al always seem to be doing things faster than we are. And I'm okay with that and quite happy with that, quite, quite frankly. And so we're gonna see this notion of second wave uh, spreads and how prevalent they are or are not third wave and so on. And we're going to learn a lot from that. And so I think, you know, being a fast follower for lack of a better term to use and, and watching the vaccine evolutions, knowing there's just general constraints on how fast these things can roll out and the second and third waves of other countries. I think that'll, that'll allow us to put a picture together, but think about how many unknowns there are in that right now. Tons. Uh one, uh, Mr. Bukhari, do you want to add something? Well, you started with gun control things. Uh, yeah, gun control, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but they, uh, they went to other direction. With regard to gun control. No, gu gun control, I'll come back to in, in a second. Just you want to add anything that when it no, could nothing, end? Uh, no, I have a specific thing to mention with regard to gun control. Okay, I'll come back to that. Uh, uh, actually, before I go, I, I just have one more thing people have curious to know that um, uh, prices, like some groceries, there is a complaint that uh, they're in this pandemic situation, uh, some groceries owners, uh, they're raising the price. Um, what do you want to say anything about that, uh, Nathaniel? Did you hear anything about that, that um, uh, unfairly they raise the price, uh, taking this? Uh, yeah, I, I I saw some concerns raised about hand sanitizer specifically that was brought to my attention. I also saw, and just uh, I think it's uh, an important point to make just at the outset, I talked about all levels of government working together, but I think it's really important to note that we have uh, obviously a liberal prime minister and a, and a conservative premier. It was the conservative premier's comments that I would point to to call out uh, that that level of jacking up prices in, in a really unfair way and to say it's absolutely unacceptable. And I haven't seen since those comments and sort of the threat of government action, should we continue to see it? I have not seen or constituents have not brought so many other cases to my attention. What, what should people do if they uh, face this kind of problem? I mean, if there is if there's an obvious example of uh companies increasing goods in a really unfair way in the course of the pandemic then please bring it to my attention and, and uh, i will i will make sure that i pass it on to the decision makers where it's most relevant and also from the province uh, there is a toll-free number uh, to call them for price uh, gouging uh, exactly. call them also okay thank you uh i want to go to the issue, one of the issue, uh, uh, gun control. 22 people killed in Nova Scotia a few days ago. Uh, why government can take serious action on controlling guns in Canada? What was, like, what is the problem? Like, if I ask you, Nathaniel, start with Nathaniel. I don't think there's a problem with the government taking serious action on guns. I, th I think the starting point uh, that it's important to note is that we do have strong gun laws here in the country already and that our government in the last parliament improved those laws uh, as well. And then we went further and, and well, we could have potentially jammed additional changes right before the election. We had previously criticized the conservative government under Stephen Harper of doing a similar thing, but watering down the uh, watering down gun control right before the election. And so through an order in council. And so we, we opted not to do that. And we opted instead to run on a platform that included stronger gun control. And we did just that. We were elected on that platform. And 
but for this pandemic uh, upending our parliament to a large degree, although we just restarted our virtual city, uh, the first virtual parliament took place today um, with with relative success, I would say. But uh, but for the pandemic, I mean, work would continue to, you know, we would be introducing legislation to strengthen gun control even further. And no, you're never going to stop gun violence completely. Um, and so you, there's, there's no perfect answer to, to, to a horrible tragedy like what happened in, in uh, Nova Scotia, just as there's no perfect answer to stopping the tragedy that happened on the Danforth. But um, we, of course we have to strengthen gun control where it's sensible to do so and, and where the evidence dictates that we, we could potentially save lives. Uh, Bryce, what is your perspective? That our yeah. government doing enough that, uh, to control the guns? Look, it, it's it's a it's a good good and complicated question. It's the right question to ask, and I, I, I'm going to start by saying here that obviously my and my, my I don't have kids. My my and my wife's hearts go out to the whole community, the victims, their families, and all the people touched by this. So I'll start there. But what I don't want to do is stop there. Okay. And what often happens, and particularly when you look south of the border with Second Amendment and you know the political pressures around this, is they stop there and they do this and it, they've almost got a script for it. There's no script here in Canada, okay? And I wanna, if you'll humor me, I'd like to tell a story that profoundly impacted me on the gun issue. And then I'll give you a few thoughts on, on how I would think about it. And the story goes as follows. About a year and a bit ago, my wife and I traveled to Miami, Florida for a, a little bit of hot weather in February. Okay. And when we go, when we travel, we're big fans of literature and authors. And we went to a book reading that was, uh, or a, an author speech that was scheduled in Miami. Okay. And the author that we signed up for was a gentleman by the name of David Cullen. David Cullen wrote a book a long time ago. Uh, sadly about the Columbine school shootings in the United States. Okay. And he wrote that book. It was one of the first big school shootings in the U S to try to explain and just understand what had happened and communicate that to the United States. Okay. And then he kind of went quiet. And then there was a, a school shooting uh, a year, two years ago in Florida called Parkland. Okay. A different high school, similar kind of situation. And he wrote a book also called Parkland, okay? And so he was doing a speech about this book that he had written, okay? And it was a, it was a high school just north of Miami, and it was a shooter with significant weaponry, and he had killed, sadly, a number of, of, of victims, okay? And we went into this room, and there were 20 or 30 people in the room that were there to listen to this speech by the author talking about these issues. And the owner of the bookstore, who I've gotten to know, uh, intro came up to introduce the situation and in introducing and talking about Columbine and talking about Parkland, I would suggest that he threw a bit of a curveball at the audience and he first introduced a gentleman to introduce the author who was a father of one of the victims of the Parkland shooting. Okay. Now we did not know this was going to come. We didn't know this was going to happen. Okay. And the father was an extraordinarily articulate man who came up, it was about a year after the tragedy, and he walked through the event, the, the, the issues in the US around this stuff, and the movement that formed out of Parkland of the youth and the peers of these poor victims and how they took on some of the causes that they did. And what came out of that, first of all, it was profoundly emotional. And, um, you know, there were a lot of tears in the room and there was a lot of sympathy, obviously, and empathy for this situation. But three things struck me in that, four things actually struck me in that conversation. They, they summarized what they saw as three of the biggest issues around the gun violence in the United States. Number one is gun control, and we can't compare the U.S. to Canada, obviously. Number two is the act of lionizing the killer, so a lot of media attention on the killer. And number three is the absolute abysmal mental health system in the United States of America. Okay. Yeah. And look, a lot of us have problems with mental health systems, but they, they have a big one. Okay. And I asked him a few questions about this. I identified myself as the Canadian in the room. And at the end of it, he came up to me and he said, you are a lucky man 
to be living in Canada. You thank your lucky stars every day. You guys have your head screwed on right on this stuff. And uh, I, I, I think I shed a tear when he did that. It was an incredible moving experience for me, okay? Now, so so I've thought a lot about the issue in general coming out of that. It kind of had that, that impact on me. And when I think about gun control, I hit it as follows, okay? First of all, I'm a data guy and I'm a framework guy. So I wanna understand the data and I know that's a human element, but when you step back, you have to look and see what's really going on, okay? And I think that, and Nathaniel might be able to correct me on this, but I think the data generally shows in Canada that the by far, I've seen 80 and 90% numbers of gun violence being, being committed by guns that are not registered or uh, legally purchased in the Canadian system, okay? So take that data stat, and then let me frame gun control in two dimensions. Dimension one is the legal side of gun control, okay? Nathaniel talked about that. I think we have a decent system here, okay? What guns can you legally purchase? Quite restricted. What qualifications, background checks, cooling off periods, gun club registrations, so on and so forth are required to acquire a gun? Significant. What registrations and tracking are required at point of purchase and thereafter? Reasonable. What are storage and transport restrictions? Reasonable. We can quibble. Some will fall more on restriction. Some will fall less, depending on your ideology and so on. But Canada, like the UK, maybe like Australia and so on, New Zealand, we have our heads screwed on right, in my opinion, on how we think about legal guns. The issue, the, the issue I think that's bigger here is the illegally owned guns. Okay, And, and, and I, I think of it across a number of dimensions, and it's a far more complicated issue because you're now into criminal behavior, you're into the legal system and all that kind of stuff. But just to walk through it quickly, I kind of break it into three. One is, do we need to look at criminal penalties, minimum sentencing, and different bail conditions for possession and trafficking of illegal firearms? Okay, I think that's something that is super important to think about, okay? Number two is, if you look at controls, policing and enforcement, so our border controls around guns coming from the south, which obviously there's so many guns there that they're, you know, they leak across our border. There's a trend to domestic purchasing legally, shaving serial numbers and then selling. That's a big issue to me. And then interestingly with technology, people are starting to manufacture guns using 3D printing and things that never enter the system. So how do we control the actual movement of these illegal guns? Okay, and then third, I put as an other category. What is other? Other is mental wellness. Back to mental wellness. We see a theme here. Poverty reduction, okay? Controversial, but when you look at community policing, you know, Mayor Bloomberg in New York um, probably was way too aggressive on the issue of stop, frisk, and carding, but there is some statistics that would suggest violent crime by gun went down significantly under his mayoral terms. Now, I'm not advocating necessarily for that, but I'm saying that there is a lot of thought, I think, that needs to go into the side of guns that are completely outside of, you know, do we allow a handgun sale or not legally? And my general view is a victim first view. I like to be tougher on these issues than not. I like to even be, I like to be stricter on the legal but those are the kinds of questions that we have as a country and that we have to continue to think about and to get better at and respect the victims of these heinous Thank crimes. You. Thank you, Bryce. So, uh, Nathaniel, do you agree with these points? And if you do, then why those things are not, uh, government are not doing those things, like in, in terms of registering the guns? Um, like some countries I know, they have licensing system. Uh, why yeah, we, we do though we, we we do we have a very strong licensing system now keep in mind also in the last parliament and it was because we ran on it in 2015 we absolutely strengthened that system further so we strengthened background checks as an example to extend it beyond a five-year period of time uh, so there there have been steps to strengthen already strong gun control and then when we look to this parliament we had made commitments in relation to banning sort of military style assault weapons is the way it was described in the platform. And we, we also made a commitment to strengthen uh, control of handguns. So already we have a rule and it's a strong rule that you can only use a handgun at a licensed facility at a gun range. And so we've, we've promised to give municipalities greater power. I, I would go further and, and if we take a victim first approach and, and I think 
uh, that is uh, certainly representing Beaches East York and working directly and knowing the those deeply affected by the Danforth shooting, they have come out and they have called for uh, a ban on the private possession of handguns, which frankly is is inflammatory for gun owners in some parts of our country, but is really a, a pretty soft extension of an existing rule. Because if you can only use a handgun at a licensed facility, it's not a great additional knock on rule to say you can only store it at that facility. And so, uh, you know, how we talk about when we use the word ban versus central storage, for example, I know it, it's a challenge in, in certain parts of, of the country. My, my preferred rule, frankly, would be that we have a federal set of minimum standards to say, for example, that there is a ban on the private possession of handguns and that municipalities could opt out. I don't want to put the onus on victims to go city by city by city by city to do that advocacy. I think that municipal councillors duly elected and knowing what's best and in the best interest of their community and accountable to those communities could say in this community, central storage it isn't going to work because we are too remote. We don't, the, the gun facility is unable to make those investments and we are reasonably rural and safe that we are going to opt out of the federal system. But I think that would be a much more credible way of approaching our platform promise. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, Mr. Bukhari, do you like to add something? Well, uh, my sympathies to the victims of those uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, 22 people died there. And uh, if we look into the mandate later, of the appointment of the uh, our federal minister of public safety and preparedness um, that mandate data uh, from the prime minister justin trudeau uh, issued on december 13 it is on the online you can see that and there are several uh, several things are written there but i like to mention a few things like uh, uh, justin trudeau when uh, appointed the uh, public safety minister, he mentioned in that letter, you will continue your leadership on organized crime reduction and border security and will implement the government's firearms commitments. With support from the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, implement our firearms policy commitments, including to amend Canada's firearms laws to ban all military style assault rifles with an associated buyback program and two year amnesty work with provinces and territories to give municipalities the ability to further restrict or ban handguns, update firearms license requirements. All these things are there. Uh, but uh, how much uh, as a member of parliament, Mr. Nathaniel, since you are one of our strong boys in the parliament and the House of Commons of Canada, how do you perceive this uh, letter and how uh, you consider the implementation process? Well, so this letter is based on our platform promises and our platform promises were realized largely because of strong advocacy of members of our caucus to say we need to make gun control a significant issue in this coming election and we need to improve gun control. And I want to get to, I, I think Bryce made a very good point that it is not only about gun control, there are some significant investments that need to be made in our communities that will probably have a, a, a much more significant long-term impact on reducing this kind of violence. But uh, in terms of implementation today, look, we had an election in October. The House of Commons traditionally, in my experience at least, which is a relatively short experience, but outside of the both October elections, we have sat in December. We have then reconvened full time, frankly, at the end of January with the full parliamentary system underway. And when you think of it in that context, we started at the end of January sitting on a full time basis and in, we'd already introduced some really key pieces of our platform, but largely just the, the, the throne speech. And so we then see this pandemic hit us in March and we, we just haven't had the time. So you see prime minister say in the wake of this tragedy that we are going to continue forcefully moving forward on gun control. It requires parliament to resume in a way that we can see other legislation. And we have to date only seen COVID measures and, and, and rightly so I would say uh, where we are seized with the wage subsidy legislation we are seized with soon to be seized with a support package of nine billion dollars we've been seized with the canada emergency response benefit and 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 so on and so on and so on and so i we we absolutely do need to in this parliament we will get to this issue there is no question uh, but the the pandemic has has obviously put a pause on that to some extent and and let me just finish by saying 
investing, we don't talk enough in politics about the social determinants of health. And similarly, we don't talk enough about the need for long-term investments. And it's a challenge in politics, which is sometimes a short-term business, but we, we do absolutely need long-term investments in our community. And that means education. That means investments in community programming for young people to make sure that they don't see the opportunity in, uh, in organized crime and they see opportunity elsewhere. And I also think, and we, we don't often think of it in this context, but uh, yes, we need stronger gun control and the criminologists at U of T will tell you there's straw purchasing that happens and we can crack down around the edges around our, and we, and we should strengthen already strong gun control. But I'll tell you, like we need to reform some of our other criminal justice policies too. And so we can take a look at bail and, th and that's something we promise to do. I, I don't think that's likely to be uh, a serious solution in some ways because the real data point on bail is not, did you commit a crime in the first place, but are you likely to commit a crime when you are out on bail. And without those numbers, it's not a particularly helpful data point to say this number of, uh, the, these number of people are, are out on bail having committed a, a, a gun crime. The real number is how many people have recommitted offense while out. Uh, but the I, I, I do think we need to have a more serious conversation in this country about our drug policies because our drug, our, the, the drug prohibition in our country fuels organized crime and organized crime leads to gun violence. That is just the fact of the matter in our society. And until we until we better reduce poverty, until we better address some of these other policies that are problematic, like like overall drug prohibition, I think we're going to continue to see at, at some points, we'll reduce it as best as we can, but we're going to continue to see at some points violence in our communities. And that obviously doesn't speak to all uh, all violent offenses and, and mental health becomes a big part of reducing this, uh, this kind of offense as well. And, and, and we can't stamp it out completely. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what policies could have been in place to prevent the, uh, to prevent the no, the tragedy in Nova Scotia. I don't know what policies could have been in place. And while yes, the Danforth shooter obtained the particular gun that he used, it was stolen from a shop in Saskatoon. And so stronger storage rules. So you don't have to keep it in a cabinet, but you have to keep it in something uh, much more secure potentially that stops that one gun from coming into his hand, but his brother was selling drugs and had other guns on him and he was probably going to be able to access a different firearm. And so it is not easy to stamp this out completely no matter what policies we put in place. Thank you. Uh, we, we are almost uh, at the end of the show. Uh, just before we go, uh, I have one quick thing to ask. Uh, in the federal level, uh, we have a liberal government. And in the provincial, uh, we have um, conservative government. Uh, so if I ask uh, Nathaniel that uh, from your uh, point of view, that how is our provincial government doing? And I'll ask the same question to uh, Bryce that uh, how our federal government is doing in terms of COVID um, controlling things. I think we have seen and we've spoken about real challenges in our long-term care homes. And I, I think, again, if we are to do a reflection many months from now, we can point to some challenges at the federal level. And when we point to challenges at the provincial level, the the lack of acting quickly enough on protecting and locking down those long-term care homes is likely to be the, the biggest recommendation for change that will come out of this. Um, in terms of other provincial response overall, I, I would like to see a little bit stronger incentives on the commercial uh, tenancy piece to ensure that we've got a program that we've just rolled out in collaboration with provinces, it should be noted, to give landlords an incentive to reduce rent for their tenants. Not all landlords are going to participate, and I would like to see the province be a little bit more forceful to push them into participation into that program. But overall, I got to say, if you ask me months before this took place, whether Premier Ford would be deferential and respectful of and be elevating the voices of public health experts, I wouldn't have been so certain. I would have said, well, when it comes to public transit infrastructure decisions, when it comes to climate change decisions, when it comes to the opioid crisis, when it comes to previous public health cuts, I don't know that I am confident that the Premier is going to elevate experts and, and respect public health expertise. And I got to say, I have been pleasantly surprised. And I I, 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 I have always, in, in some ways, respected both 
Fords, frankly, the the straightforward nature of their political communication and the way that they are able to connect to people of all backgrounds. Uh, but I, I have to say and, and highlight the importance not only of the Premier Ford and his government's willingness to work with folks from other parties, his willingness to call out uh, yahoos, he described them, who are uh, ignoring public health advice and protesting against public health advice. He's completely previously he said wonderful things about Donald Trump. And in this case, he very clearly said absolutely unacceptable that you are jeopardizing our supply chains on PPE. And he was right. And so I, I, I got to say a lot of respect for his communication and a lot of respect for his decision making in respecting, respecting public health expertise. And I hope that kind of work continues throughout this and, and, and after this. Thank you. Bryce, about so, uh, federal. Yeah, so on the federal liberal side, I think they get a pretty clean pass here. Um, the What I like about the situation is, is that it, it, it's been prioritized effectively to me, health first, which we've talked mostly about on this call, economic, a close second. Um, they have thought about, and I, I think more about the economic side generally in my life, uh, they've thought about a pretty logical way of trying to attack the big items hit them with the least amount of friction and the maximum amount of impact. And importantly, they haven't been dogmatically unwilling to make some changes as things come up. Okay. So I kind of like the, it, 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 again, I keep coming back to one of the guys I really like is Mayor Bloomberg and the way he approached things from kind of a business perspective. I see a lot of those attributes in the way the feds have, have kind of taken this on. Um, where I will say that the business community has concern is there's starting to be a feeling that some of the measures are dragging a bit in terms of getting out there. Uh, the wage subsidy, you know, opened yeah. on Monday, 44,000 businesses. Like this stuff is in demand and we're starting to get, businesses run so thin in many industries that you don't have a lot of runway here when, when you need support. So that would be the one, that would be one knock. And then the other knock, and I gotta, I gotta go right to where Nathaniel went is, about a month ago, I did a call out to the innovation ecosystem saying, I want your, I want to gather collective feedback on, on occupancy cost, i.e. rents. Okay. And we see that as one of the biggest line items in our businesses, in our portfolio, both from a landlord and from a tenant perspective. And I am very concerned uh, about the next month and the month after in terms of what's going to happen there. Yeah. And I think that one can't react completely to everything in one minute. But when we cast an eye a little bit further down, still in the in the in the pre-recovery phase, still reaction, um, the the next big item that we've been talking about after occupancy is: do we need to take another run at our bankruptcy and insolvency legislation temporarily? Um, if you look at Canada, we have, you know, we have two at uh, two acts around that. And do we need to add a third temporary measure to deal with the businesses that, that are going to fail and see if there are ways to put them back in business without complete destruction? So that's that's for a later day, not that much later, but a later day. But in general, they get a pass. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bukhari, do you like to add anything Very in 30 seconds? Well, uh, I find uh, Mr. Nathaniel is so fair in his uh, remarks. And also, Mr. Bryce, he made uh, fair comments and uh, fair ideas. He uh, it's, uh, presented uh, uh, that is wonderful. But the thing is that uh, in upcoming um, election, uh, which would be a, a referendum for the level government uh, in the federal level, and also in the provincial level, that is also a referendum for the um, for the provincial government, Ford government. So. Uh, if they manage well, I think uh, they can do better in the election. Uh, that is my perception overall. But uh, one thing I'd like to add for Mr. Nathaniel, that in Bangladesh, the test kit, uh, what they invented, uh, that is not swab-based test. It is a blood-based test, and it is very quickly, within an hour, you can get the result. And uh, the Center for Disease Control in the United States, they also received a, a um, um, uh, one of the uh, copy of that invention. So okay. you can inquire that if you require from the Canadian government their inventory. Thank you. Uh, I like to uh, end this show, uh, but before I go, uh, do you like to say a very few 
last few things uh, in 30 seconds, Nathaniel and Bryce? I, I would just say for anyone tuning in and who has further questions or needs support from my office, I'm lucky to have the team that I do. I have two staff members who are from the Bangladeshi community and who are core to my operation and responding to constituent concerns. So please reach out nathaniel.erskine-smith at parl.gc.ca. We're working from home, but we're absolutely working hard every single day. And if you have any questions or concerns, please be in touch. Thank you, Bryce. Yeah, I have one uh, little story that I want to tell as it relates to the community. Um, when we started with Mobile, the wireless company in Canada, um, I took over HR in 2011. And by that point, we had quite a store footprint. And we happened to have a store in Shoppers World at the southwest corner of Vic Park in Danforth. And one of our policies that we put in place after I took over HR was that every corporate executive had to do a shift a year in a store. And I ended up doing my first shift as the CFO of the company at, at Shoppers World. And I spent the day working with a lovely staff group. Uh, I think there were some Bengali staff uh, helping with the community. Of <laughs> and I want to tell you, I want to thank the community for being very early supporters of Win Mobile, now called Freedom. And you guys were awesome. And I had such an enjoyable experience that day. So it's very nice to be able to re-interface back to the community. Thanks very much for Thank having Thank you me. very much, Bryce. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali Bukhari. Um, viewers, uh, we are uh, going to finish this uh, show today. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, hope we all together will be able to overcome the situation we are going through uh, like we did in the past. Um, until we, uh, we have the vaccine and um, um, other treatment available. We must maintain our social and physical distance. And of course, has to be cautious um, uh, above all. Hope to see you all again. Stay safe wherever you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm.